Welcome everybody. My name is Julie Potter and I'm the co-chair for Women in Leadership Victoria chapter. We are so thrilled that you can join us tonight. We have a phenomenal speaker for the career development workshop. And before I introduce you all to Heather, I just want to share a little bit about Women in Leadership with you and also about the Victoria chapter who's putting on tonight's event. As many of you know, Women in Leadership Foundation delivers inspirational programs that bring women together to collaborate in the development of their leadership skills and create positive change in the future of women's leadership. The Victoria chapter just started up this past fall. While COVID definitely made it a bit more challenging to get things up and running, we persevered and are happy to be able to bring together virtual events that inspire, connect and support a community of so many amazing women. I'm now going to pass it over to Laureen, the speaker series lead for the Victoria chapter to introduce tonight's speaker. Thanks, Julie. I have the pleasure of introducing to you Heather Van Munster, who is a full-time mom to two young boys here in Victoria, BC. She is a full-time worker and employee at IBM. She volunteers as a co-chair for the local chapter for women in leadership. And throughout her career, not surprisingly, given all of her different roles, she has been passionately curious on bridging the connection between personal wellness and professional success. She's a self-care strategist on a mission to help others up-level their lives personally and professionally. Thanks for being here and let's welcome Heather Von Munster. Uh, thank you so much for the warm welcome, Lillian, and thank you, Julie. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with all of you to cover this timely topic this evening. But before we dive in, I just wanna welcome you all to just get settled in for this next hour. I just want you to take a deep breath and close your eyes for a moment. Leave all the stress from your day behind you. Gently push away any other worries, tasks, thoughts, or to-dos, and just bring your awareness to your breath. There's nowhere else you need to be. Now place your hands on your stomach and take two big belly breaths, noticing your stomach rise and fall with each inhale and exhale. Now just keep breathing deeply into your stomach. And as you breathe in, I want you to breathe in for a count of five. Hold your breath for a count of five. And breathe out slowly for a count of five. And let's just do this one more time. In for five. Hold for five. And out for five. Great. So I'd now just like to slowly bring your attention back to the room, noticing the sounds around you and begin to slowly open your eyes. Oh, it just feels so nourishing when we just take that moment to reset. So now that we're all here and we're present, I just want to formally kick things off by saying thank you for carving out time for yourself today to explore these self-care strategies, which are essential to effective leadership. If 2020 has taught us anything, it's how important it is that we take care of ourselves and one another. Most people think if they just keep grinding and hustling that they will eventually reap the benefits of their hard work and rise to the top. But the reality is all this will do is ultimately lead you to burnout. And I think we can all agree, we're here to blossom, not burn out. And what a time it is for us women to change and shape the way we show up as leaders. In our society, masculine traits tend to be more valued than the feminine. 
The masculine energy is associated with independence, competitiveness, drive, confidence, and sometimes even aggression and arrogance. Whereas feminine energy is nurturing, it's loving, tending, compassionate, and caring. And while some of those masculine traits can certainly help us to achieve and succeed, they can also leave us feeling overworked with little time for ourselves. And then we're essentially off balance. And in order to, to restore that balance, we need to embrace our feminine energy. And that begins by nurturing, loving, tending, and caring for ourselves. So there's this beautiful Cherokee prophecy that I want to share before we get into the thick of the talk tonight. I stumbled on this beautiful artwork on Instagram by the artist named of Shannon Contreras. It immediately piqued my interest to see what this post was all about, and it led me to this Cherokee prophecy about this century. It said that the bird of humanity has a male wing and a female wing, and the bird of humanity has been flying for centuries, primarily with only its male wing. The female wing has unable to be fully extended. And since the male wing has had to keep the bird of humanity afloat, the male wing has become over-muscularized, over-developed, and in fact, somewhat violent. The bird of humanity has been flying in circles as a result and unable to fly in the right direction. The prophecy says that in this 21st century, the female wing will fully extend and express itself both in men and women. The male energy or the yang energy will relax and the bird of humanity will soar. It's more important than ever that we soften into our feminine again and trust that our feminine essence is powerful. We can lead the change for a more balanced way to work and live. Arianne Huffington wrote, the, care, the current male dominated model of success, which equates success with burnout, sleep deprivation and driving yourself into the ground isn't working for women and it's not working for men either. We are at an inflection point as a result from this pandemic. And as leaders, it's our job to look out for what's best for our company, for our clients, for our teams, but it's also our job to look within and lead by example. With all the uncertainty and added stress we're dealing with from this pandemic, the fusion of home and work life, enforced physical isolation, and a less than rosy economic outlook, not to mention climate change, racial unrest, the 24 seven news cycle, self-care is a necessity and needs to be your number one priority. As women, mothers, caregivers, nurturers, and leaders in our communities, there hasn't been a more important time to put ourselves first and have a clear understanding that self-care is not indulgent, it's our duty. If there's one thing I want you to take from today's presentation is that self-care is essential to living a full and successful life. The fact that all of you are here and a part of our Will community already tells me that you have a desire to grow personally and professionally. And if there's one gift that I could leave you with today, is for you to feel empowered to put yourself first. Because when we do that, that's when we fully step into our power and that's when we transform how we show up in the world. So we'll now just walk us through the agenda on what we're gonna cover tonight. But by all means, I want you to you know, use the chat function in the Zoom, share your ideas, thoughts, and any questions you may have. Um, Lauren, who's also on our board in the Victoria chapter, she'll be moderating a chat. So by all means, Lauren, stop me and interrupt me along the way. All right, so we'll begin by clarifying what self-care truly is, what it is not. Then we'll get into exploring those three main pillars as shown here on this Venn diagram and how we can weave self-care strategies within each of these pillars. We'll discuss how to create a thriving work culture by making self-care a priority, how willpower can only get you so far when creating a new routine and how habit stacking is the way to go. We'll touch on cycle thinking and how we can use our hormone cycle to our advantage. And then we'll wrap up with a call to action and open discussion. So what is self-care? By Google's definition, it's the practice of taking action to preserve or improve one's own health. Three words I like here, action. It takes work, but it's so worth it. You need to be intentional with scheduling self-care in. Preserve, think of nurturing and maintaining what you've already worked for. Improve, think of this as an increased capacity to be your best self as a whole. I think it's really important that we tune into this slide and get crystal clear on what self-care is and what it is not. We need to change the narrative of it being selfish, indulgent, or a waste of time to the words on the right. It's our responsibility and part of our life's work to take care of ourselves. My mom would say, no one can love you until you love yourself. Well, the same goes with self-care. How can you truly take care of anyone else if you aren't taking care of yourself? You simply can't pour from an empty cup. 
Next word here, essential. It should be your number one priority as it literally affects every area of your life. When we practice self-care, we can truly transform our realities and step into becoming the fullest expression of ourselves. We as women have come a long way in terms of progress and equality, especially in the workplaces, and we're working harder than ever. We're taking charge of our careers, our finances, our community and family needs, and it's time to fully commit to taking charge of our own self-care needs. It's especially key for leaders as we're responsible for other people. As a leader, you owe it to yourself and to your team to prioritize self-care and to lead by example. I like to think of leaders similar to athletes. Both roles, they require endurance, stamina, the ability to handle pressure, accountability, dedication to their team, strategic thinking, ongoing skill development, and resiliency. That's a big one. And lastly, to touch on the capacity building aspect of self-care, you know, many people think it's just too much time, they don't have the energy, but the reality is, is that the more energy that you invest in the self-care, it's going to pay off big time. You will have more energy, you will make better decisions, and you'll be a more productive and effective leader. And just before we leave this slide, I just want to point out the word here, selfless, which they say is the opposite of selfish. I know we've been socially conditioned to think that being selfless is something to be proud of. I still hear it often. Oh, she's so selfless. You know, what a wonderful, hardworking woman. But let's pause here for a moment. Why is being less of self something to be proud of? It's not, period. So let's rid ourselves of the notion that selflessness is a badge of honor and start to honor ourselves. All right, so now that we have that out of the way, let's break down this overarching term of self-care into three pillars. So as part of the successful leadership protocol, we need to ensure that we're prioritizing our physical, mental, emotional, and social needs. We'll discuss how food, hydration, movement, sleep, and the environment in which we surround ourselves in affects our physical body. We'll then explore how mental hygiene plays a significant role in literally everything we do, how we can use our breath, conserve our brain power and how we can incorporate mindfulness, meditation and manifestation into our daily lives and the power of having a positive mindset. And this third pillar here is, is all on how to honor our emotional and social needs by setting boundaries, incorporating self-care habits to build our resiliency and how we need to keep more connected than ever, especially in this pandemic as we continue to remain physically distanced. So this first pillar is all about the physical, the environment we create within our bodies with the foods we use to fuel ourselves, physically keeping our bodies in motion, the importance of good sleep hygiene, and also exploring how our external environment is physically set up for self-care success. I've been in far too many meetings where folks are guzzling down their diet sodas or their juices and having those sugar-laden pastries. And then when it's about a half an hour, the entire vibe of the room lowers. People are yawning, slouching, getting distracted, not able to focus or make decisions, the list goes on. So choosing foods that fuel your body and getting an adequate hydration is key to how you perform. Think input, output, garbage in, garbage out, good in, good out. What you eat has a direct impact on how you perform. Eating isn't just about satisfying hunger, especially for women like us who are fully showing up in all areas of our lives. We're expending way more of our energy than we ever have before, which increases our energy needs and our nutritional requirements. When we think of athletes and how they eat, it's so specific to enhance performance. It's so much more than calories in, calories out. I firmly believe that food is medicine. Dr. Mike, Mark Hyman talks about how food is information and how it regulates almost every function of our body. He says that food is the code that programs our biology and that we can literally upgrade or downgrade our biological software with the food we consume. And as you can see, I've highlighted a, you know, a handful of these performance enhancing foods on the slide, but what I really want you to focus on is just to choose whole foods that don't contain a laundry list of ingredients, additives, and preservatives. Think the outer aisles of the grocery store. This is the simplest and most effective rule to follow. As you know, there's so many diets out there and each unique to the indiv ind individual. And I'm not here to tell you you know, what you should eat because I don't know your body. But what I want to highlight here is the fact that there is a direct connection on how you perform based on what you eat. And on the flip side of what to eat, quick highlight on what to avoid. Here, think the inner aisles of the grocery store. Sure, there's some great products in those inner aisles, but read the labels. The closer we can get to eating foods in their natural form, the better. Many health foods today are marketed as healthy, but they're actually highly processed and not ideal for us to consume. If there are just way too many ingredients or ingredients you can't pronounce or you've never heard of, 
it's just a good rule of thumb to leave it on the shelf. There's so many toxic ingredients out there that affect our physical health, brain health, and hormone health. So when you eat well, you feel better, you perform better. And choosing the right ingredients for success all begins with having a plan. So have you heard the saying, a Sunday well spent brings a week of content? Well, I am so on board with this. The hours I save during the week is so worth the time I spend on Sundays getting me and my family organized for the week. I always start with planning out the dinners and tables for lunches. Sometimes I'll dig out my cookbooks or browse Pinterest for some food info. And then from there, I lock down the meal plan, create the shopping list. Does anyone else cringe when their, their family says what's for dinner? I know everyone's on meat, so just uh, just me. <laughs> well, it can be so laborsome just coming up with meal ideas day after day. So I find when I plan ahead, I avoid that cringy question of what's for dinner. It saves me mental energy by making the decisions for the week in one sitting. It also saves me extra trips to the grocery store, saving me stress and money. And it also keeps my nutrition in check because I'm making healthier choices at, while I'm in that planning process. So after you've come up with your weekly meal plan, you've bought your grocery haul for the week, it's time to get your prep on. So when you get home, unload everything, wash and chop all your fred, your fruits and veggies, put them in containers, make your marinade dressing and some dips for the week. You could boil some eggs for some quick grab and go snacks, you know, portion out things like nuts and crackers. And another great tip for Sunday prep is batch cooking. So if I make a lasagna, like I'll always make two, one for now, one for freezer. So Think of those meals that you can double up on that you can save time for future. So think of anything that freezes well, soup, stews, anything like that. So trust me, the time and energy you'll save all week long by dedicating a few hours on Sunday is a total game changer. Try it for a week and see what you think. All right, now on to hydration. Coffee isn't the only thing that will help us achieve our leadership goals. Don't get me wrong, I love, love, love coffee and wine, but too much will just lead to dehydration, which leads to a decrease in cognitive function, decrease in performance, not to mention exhaustion, headaches, muscle cramps, difficulty focusing, irritability. Drinking enough water each day is crucial for so many reasons. It helps to regulate your body temperature. It keeps your joints lubricated, prevents infections. It delivers nutrients to our cells, keeps our organs functioning properly. It also improves our, our sleep quality, cognition, mood, the list goes on. And although the old standard for hydration was consuming the eight glasses of eight ounces a day, the truth is, is that proper hydration really does vary on gender, age, and lifestyle. So as a minimum, what you can do is take your body weight, divide it in half, and that's how many ounces as a minimum you should drink a day. So if you're 150 pounds, aim to drink at least 75 ounces of water a day. And as you can see, I've just noticed a few uh, tips here how to increase your water take. So Start your day with water. I always drink approximately 16 ounces of warm water with lemon and apple cider vinegar before I have my morning coffee. And this does a few things. It gives me a head start on my daily water intake. It stimulates my digestion, gives me a dose of vitamin C, puts my body in a more alkaline state, and it also sets the tone for healthier habits for the rest of the day. You can also add water reminders to your calendar. Bring your water bottle everywhere you go. Um, keep a log of your water intake. That way you can be tracking your hydration goal to see where you're meeting it and where your gaps are. And again, if you're just one of those people that just doesn't like the taste of water, try to add natural flavings like cucumber, watermelon, lemon. And then obviously like herbal teas, hydrating foods, those are also a great way to chop up your hydration needs. Okay, so now that we've covered what should go into our bodies, we're going to move on to the movement aspect of self-care. Has anyone heard the saying, sitting is the new smoking? As we're all sitting here, <laughs> scary, right? Just as I say food is medicine, movement is also my medicine. I think there's still this idea out there that people think they're already so exhausted that they just don't have the energy to exercise. When in fact, movement makes energy. It delivers oxygen and nutrients to your tissues, giving you more energy to burn throughout the day. It serves as a natural stress reducer. It combats chronic stress, improves the quality of your sleep, helps to sharpen your focus, and increases your productivity and improves your overall mood. And I get that busy professionals find it hard to fit exercise into their hectic schedules. However, with all the known benefits, we, we can't afford not to invest the time to making movement a priority in our day as we know it's going to ultimately increase our productivity, our leadership effectiveness, not to mention all the physical benefits we gain as well. More and more companies are allowing employees to exercise during the workday, 
know, big giants like Google led the way with in-office gyms, Nike having in-office yoga. They're seeing the benefits that it brings to their business by seeing how much more productive their employees are post-workout. Even just scheduling some stretch breaks into your day can bring great benefits. A body in motion stays in motion. And remember, any amount of movement is good movement. So schedule it in. Make it a priority. Okay, speaking of priorities, let's talk about sleep. Ah, sleep. Something we probably all need more of, including me. <laughs> and as we shift more into the feminine, we need to ditch that whole we will sleep when we are dead concept, as this is just adding to the list of things that are bringing us to burnout. Sleep is this essential function that allows our bodies and minds to recharge. When we think of muscle building, it's all about the tear and repair. Work the muscle to fatigue and then allow it to rest so the muscle grows. So when we're trying to grow our business or simply just grow professionally, we need to have a healthy sleep routine. When we deprive ourselves of sleep, we increase the risk of a weakened immune system, weight gain, reduced brain power, heart disease, diabetes, the list goes on. Just like we need food, water, and oxygen to survive, we also need sleep. Invest in rest. The payoff is well worth it. And here are a few sleep hygiene suggestions that you can consider incorporating into your routine. So if your mind is buzzing and thoughts are swirling, write them down so you don't take those to bed with you. I also find having a wind down routine helps my brain and body to know it's time to shut down for the day. Through the health app on my iPhone, I set my sleep sleep schedule for the week. And then each night it prompts me 30 minutes before my target bedtime to start to wind down. At that point, my phone also goes into sleep mode. So I'm not interrupted with all the pings and dings from emails and texts. In my wind down time, I also, when I also take my bedtime supplements. Uh, I currently only take magnesium. And side note on magnesium, it's often referred to as the miracle mineral as it supports hundreds of chemical reactions in our bodies. It can also help with sleep by relaxing our muscles and calming our nervous. And then after I take my supplements, I have a cup of tea, I set my things out for the next morning. It's a pretty basic routine, but it works for me. And lastly, keep your room dark and quiet and do aim for eight hours of sleep each night. Right, so now that we've covered the importance of what goes into our bodies, how we should move our bodies, allow our bodies to rest and truly recover, I want to quickly go over how we can ensure our external environment is physically set up for self-care success. As most of us are working from home, here are a few strategies to help keep your physical environment in check. Designate a workspace just for work. Stay away from that designated space when you're not working. Ensure your desk, monitor, and chair are also set to the right height. By implementing good ergonomic solutions, you're going to be more comfortable and more productive. And will also hopefully help you to avoid all those costly chiro appointments. Good lighting. Lighting is an area people don't really think about. Overhead is best over lamps, but nothing beats natural light. Working in a space of natural light will reduce headaches and eye strain and also allows you to be more productive. Make sure that your monitor's brightness isn't too dim or too bright either to avoid eye strain. Essential oil diffusers. I love having these diffusers in my home and I do have one just specifically in my office. Um, certain oils can enhance energy, focus, drive, level of, of alertness. Uh, a few that come to mind that are great are peppermint, rosemary, lemon, and frankincense. That's an awesome one for focus. There's so many out there. So look for a few that vibe with you. You may also want to consider having some plants in your home, in your workspace or hanging some inspirational art or quotes as an added touch to improve your sense of well-being. Again, find the things that vibe with you. And declutter daily. Things have a habit of collecting in our home offices, all kinds of things, especially when you have kids. Make it a habit to purge your home office daily of whatever is taking up space and not serving any purpose. And beyond decluttering our physical space, let's now look at how we can tap into activities that declutter our minds to reduce stress and care for our mental health. So I'll just give you a moment here to look at these stats that the University of New Brunswick has published. You can see the dramatic impact that mental health has on the workplace. And these issues are costing Canadian businesses an estimated $33 billion a year in lost productivity and staff turnover. As leaders, we need to create a culture that values mental health. And that starts with you prioritizing your own mental well-being and carving out time to engage in stress-reducing activities. Let's be honest, leading and managing others is stressful. The Global Organization for Stress reports that 80% of people feel stress at work. 
So let's look at a few strategies to reduce our stress through breath work, how we can manage our mental energy by conserving brain power, and the power of meditation to keep our mental health in check. Mm -hmm. Deep breathing. It's one of the best ways to lower stress in the body as it sends a message to your brain to calm down and to relax. It increases the supply of oxygen to your brain and stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system, which promotes that state of calmness. When you're taking big, deep belly breaths, you're actually shifting and releasing negative energy instead of storing it, which is so important because all that stored up energy manifests into muscle tension, which can also lead to other physical ailments that you don't want to have to deal with. So if you're finding yourself overwhelmed and stressed, just breathe. It's the easiest and quickest way to quiet your mind and calm your body. You can do it anytime, anywhere. It doesn't cost a thing, and you always have this tool with you. Okay, now let's look at how we can manage our mental energy by conserving our brain power to boost mental performance and enhance our mental health. Do you feel exhausted at the end of your day or even partway through your day? I know I do. <laughs> Have you heard of the term decision fatigue? Well, basically what that is, is it's, the de it's a decline in energy and focus you experience after making too many decisions, which leads to poor decision making. In this hyper digital world we're all living in, we're being pulled multiple directions minute by minute, having to make decision after decision. Can anyone guess how many decisions on average we make a day? Okay, go ahead and just type a number into the chat, any number, how many decisions we make a day. Lauren, feel free to shout some out because I can't see them. We've got 500, thousands, 180, 600, 800, thousands. Not even close. I couldn't believe it when I read it, but according to the Wall Street Journal, the number is 35,000. That's right, 35,000 decisions every day. I really don't know how that's possible, but that is what's published. Researchers at Cornell University estimate we make 226.7 decisions each day on food alone. So think of your decision-making mind as a battery, and each decision you make reduces the charge of the battery, leaving you with less energy available to make other decisions later on. From the moment we wake up, we're deciding what to wear, what to eat, to more complicated decisions that involve our families, communities, our careers. And even though so many of these little decisions that we make are minor, they're still draining our brain power, causing us to experience this decision fatigue. So to avoid decision fatigue, we need to make fewer decisions. One way is to create a morning and evening routine, which reduces the number of decisions you need to make each day because it's a routine, you just automatically do them. You can also automate repeating tasks, such as setting up auto pay for recurring bills. And remember when we talked about meal planning, when you have everything all planned and prepped, you avoid making all those meal plan decisions day after day. You can also delegate decisions. So perhaps there's decisions at work that you don't need to make that you can delegate to someone on your team. Or as parents, perhaps you can delegate certain things to your children or let your partner decide which restaurant to go for date night. You can delegate decisions the same way you delegate tasks. And lastly, to avoid this decision fatigue, decrease your options. Have you ever noticed that Barack Obama, he only wears the gray or blue suit, Mark Zuckerberg with his iconic gray t-shirt, Steve Jobs with his black turtleneck and jeans? Some of the most successful people in the world have used this simple technique to save brain power to cut down on the number of decisions they need to make each day. Not to say that we should land on one uniform for the duration of our life, but we should take an honest look at our day to day and see where we can streamline decision making so we can use our brain power for the big decisions we need to make. All right, next on the list, prioritize your day. The most effective way to a productive day is to prioritize your needs, tasks, and to do's. So begin your day with prioritizing the top three things you want to achieve. You'll obviously achieve more than that, but as long as you have three things that way, it, it gives your brain some certainty and your brain likes certainty. And also by writing them down, it gets the information out of your working memory and onto the page, which reduces overload on the brain. Next, know when to take a break. You know when you need a break from that spreadsheet or PowerPoint deck you're working on, and I'm so guilty of this too, what do we typically grab for for some sort of mindless activity? our phones. We start swiping and liking and commenting, saving, sharing. And while we're, while we're thinking this is just a mindless moment, it's so not that. We're making rapid fire decisions, zapping our brain power. So when you need a break, take a real break, no screens. 
Avoid multitasking. Think about how many times you've answered emails while sitting in the meeting. Guaranteed you missed parts of that meeting, which required you to circle back to seek clarification, adding even more time to your day. Or perhaps you forgot to add the attachment in that email you were trying to send because you were also trying to listen to what was going on in the meeting. So essentially, you didn't accomplish either things, and now most likely you're feeling a rise of stress in your body. Multitasking seems like a great way to get a lot done, but our productivity goes down by as much as 40%. And the last bullet here, take the time to schedule in some mental breaks, which I refer to as these power of pause moments. We aren't just human doers, we're human beings. And having these power of pause moments is essential to your productivity and your performance and also works wonders for reducing stress. So you can take a walk or do some stretches. Anything that takes you away from your focused work for at least 15 minutes will allow your brain to catch up with you. The CEO of LinkedIn schedules four 30 minute do nothing breaks in his day. I can only imagine how demanding his schedule is. So the next time you think you can't step away from your screen for just 15 minutes, think of him. These do nothing breaks could also be meditation breaks, which we're going to move on to next. So simply put, meditation can counteract stress and help you become a calmer, collected, and a more effective leader. And for those people that are listening in and thinking, yeah, yeah, meditation sounds great. I just don't have the time. That's false. You make time. We all have the same number of hours in a day, and some of the most successful people in the world have a meditation practice. And that's not because they have more time. They make the time because they know that when they have less stress in their body, they're going to make clear decisions. They're going to accomplish their goals faster. They're going to see the increase in their productivity. So let go of the idea that you don't have time and reframe it as, I can't afford not to make time. For some of us, meditation is purely a spiritual practice, and for others, it's viewed as more of a productivity tool. Think of meditation as a reboot and a reset for your brain to be at the top of your game. Let's compare our brains to our computers for a moment. When we have too many tabs open on our computer, it slows down the engine or it freezes up altogether. And what do we do when that happens? We close the tabs and we do a reboot. So by giving yourself some quiet time to close those mental tabs, all those thoughts that are constantly whirling in your head, allowing yourself to drop into your breath and allowing there to be space between your thoughts, you're technically giving your brain a reboot and perhaps even a software upgrade, allowing you to operate and perform at your best. Essentially, meditation is giving you more computing or battery power to focus on the task at hand. Out of all the meditation practices that I've explored, I found the Ziva technique that's covered in this book here on the side, Stress Less, Accomplish More by Emily Fletcher, to be one that resonated with me the most. It was the catalyst that made me to truly committing to a daily practice. The way that Emily breaks down the difference between these three M's that are here on the side, the benefits of each and how she uncomplicates the entire process made it so easy for me to go to, I know a meditation practice will be good for me to, I can't ignore these facts any longer. And the day I finished the book was the day I committed to my practice. And one thing that I often think back to in the book is how she explains that just like the heart beats involuntarily, the mind thinks involuntarily. And thinking during meditation is an indicator that stress is actually leaving your body. Whereas before I would think I'd failed at a meditation if I couldn't fully clear my mind and thoughts would keep popping up. But that shift in perspective changed the entire way I feel about meditation now. And when people say I don't have time to meditate, Emily's favorite response is, do you have time to feel like crap? The harsh reality is that stress makes you stupid, slow, and sick. So the 2% of your day that you meditate will radically improve the other 98%. All right, so let's dive into these three M's that I just mentioned, mindfulness, meditation, and manifestation. So many people are using the terms mindfulness and meditation as synonyms, but they're not the same thing. Mindfulness is the art of bringing your awareness into the present moment and very effective at getting rid of the stress in the now. Meditation is giving your body deep healing rest and getting rid of stress from the past. Manifestation helps you to create and clarify and achieve your goals for future and that activates the creative center of the brain. In the book, she recommends two 15-minute meditation sittings each day, one in the morning and one late afternoon. And if 15 minutes just sounds too daunting, start with five minutes and slowly increase your way up. So she suggests that you start with the meditation by getting into a mindful state, by dropping into your five senses. 
This will help you drop into your body, get present and grounded before you go into your meditation. And in the book, she, she suggests repeating the same word for the duration of the sitting. So if you take her course, she gives you a custom mantra, but in the book, she just offers using the word one. So you just say that on repeat. And there will be thoughts that pop up, but you just acknowledge them. You bring your awareness back to your breath, back to your mantra until you feel that your sitting is almost complete. And then you slowly shift into your manifestation zone where you're visualizing the reality that you want to create. So let's say you're wanting to rid yourself of some sort of health condition. Picture your body physically healing itself from the inside out. Tap into those emotions that you'll feel once that condition is gone. So you're imagining whatever it is as if it's already happened. And then by the time you go through these three states or these three ends, you'll be surprised how fast 15 minutes really does go by. So this is just one meditation technique that I'm offering here, but any meditation is good meditation. There's so many great apps out there for guided meditations as well, if that resonates with you more. A few that come to mind, there's Headspace, there's the Calm app, um, Insight Timer is a great one. And I think they all offer a free trial to so try them out and see which one works best for you. And in Emily's words, we meditate to get good at life, not to get good at meditation. There really is no downside to meditation. And looking at the stat here from the Business Insider, after interviewing 140 people at the top of their fields, Tim Ferriss has discovered that 90% of them share the same habit, meditation. So before we wrap up this segment on mental health, I want to have a quick look at mindset. So mindset affects our actions and our beliefs affect our behaviors. We can either have a fixed or a growth mindset. Think of fixed as limiting and growth equating to freedom. So a person with a fixed mindset is constrained by their beliefs and thoughts. They tend to avoid challenges. They give up easily. They just keep doing what they think is working. Whereas a person with a growth mindset embraces new challenges. They have a willingness to persist and they're open to trying new things. Chances are most of us go between these two mindsets depending on what we're going through or what we're dealing with. And we all have triggers that can activate that fixed mindset. However, we have the power to shift our mindset by telling ourselves a different story. And that starts with the language that we use. So instead of saying, I don't have time for self-care, say, I will make time for self-care. When we become acutely aware of our inner dialogue, that inner voice, we can then manage it. Every time a negative thought pops up, flip on its head and rephrase it into a positive one. Now let's look at these two words, could versus should, in relation to self-care. So I'm sure many of you, as we've been going through these slides, have said to yourself, I should eat better, I should exercise more, I should meditate, I should, should, should. But what if we replace the word with could? I could eat better, I could exercise more, I could meditate. Doesn't that just feel better? It gives you the power to take control versus feeling powerless in the world of shoulds. So with that, I encourage you to really tune into your thoughts and your inner voice. Be mindful of the words you use. All right, so now that we've explored some strategies on reducing stress to protect our mental health, let's explore the third pillar on emotional and social. All right, so this pillar is one of the most important facets of your self-care practice, but often overlooked. So number one, boundaries. It's our responsibility to set our, to set our own boundaries. We teach people how to treat us. We need to ensure that we're putting our needs first. I love the term, limits are liberating. Learn to say no to others so you can say yes to yourself. As women, we tend to be people pleasers and we want to give, 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 but it's usually at the cost of our own well-being. We love to help. It's natural to want to jump in and help someone out in need, but it's important to take a step back and ask yourself, are these people actually asking for my help? I find myself extending my offer when no one's asked. I simply just take it on without thinking. And in some cases, by doing that, I overextend myself I take on other people's problems and it zaps my energy reserves that could have been used for something else. It's great to give and help and be of service, but just keep that awareness with you to protect your energy. Helping can also be looked at as another word for control. So, so just let that marinate for a moment. I also think we need to be more diligent with setting boundaries around our social media consumption. I'm sure all of us are following people in our social networks that make us feel less than. They say comparison is a thief of joy, and I couldn't agree more. I have started unfollowing accounts that trigger me, that make me feel less than, or simply just don't align with the vibe that I want to feel. 
So next time you go to add a new account to follow, look for two accounts to unfollow. Our time is precious. And why waste a second of our time consuming media that has any amount of negativity or stress to our lives? You don't owe it to anyone to follow them. Weave your feed. Give yourself permission to let go of the people who are draining your reserves. Unfriend, unfollow, unsubscribe to anyone or anything that isn't serving you. Next is building resilience. This is the ability to adapt well in the face of adversity. Well, I think we can all agree resilience has been the word of the year. Keeping your self-care in check helps you to keep your body and mind primed to deal with situations that require resilience. So basically, by prioritizing your self-care, you're also building your resilience. Next, connection. Human beings, we're, we're social animals. We all have the need for connection to others on some level, even the introverts. Brene Brown talks about how we are biologically wired to love, be loved, and to belong. And when those needs are not met, we don't function as we're meant to. In this physically distant world we're all adapting to, there's even a greater need to connect with others. Having the Zoom session here tonight serves as a great connection point. So kudos to all of you for showing up. I encourage you to make those phone calls to friends, show up to the online events, and be intentional about keeping your connections alive. And last on the slide here, community. And I think it's really important that we recognize that perhaps self-care comes easier to some than others. It's one thing to say, take care of yourself, self-care is important, but if the environment around you is unhealthy and it's not fostering that care, then it doesn't matter how much self-care you try to do, there will always be that gap. So be the leader in your space to embrace and encourage self-care and lead by example. If your community and your team knows you honor self-care, then it sets the tone for them to do the same. Which brings me to the next slide on how to create a thriving work culture by making self-care a priority. Let's just look at this quote here on the bottom. So many people spend their health gaining wealth, and then they have to spend their wealth to regain their health. Your health truly is your greatest asset, and it should be important to leaders and organizations to value the company's greatest assets, which is their people. One of the biggest challenges leaders face is finding that sweet spot between the business needs and employee welfare and wellness. We obviously want a high-performing team, but not at the expense of someone else's well-being and mental health. I still hear people in my organization celebrating the folks who work late, the colleague that feels the need to respond to that email that was sent at 11 p.m. This is a slippery slope where individuals attach their feelings of self-worth to the amount of work they're doing. And when employees are in that constant hurry and hustle mode, they're at high risk of burnout, which is a huge driver of employee turnover. So instead of celebrating working overtime, try to open up communication about ways to include breaks and downtime throughout the day, Highlight the fact that rest is critical to their productivity. Again, lead by example. Show your team that you prioritize your own self-care needs and that you encourage the same for them. When they see you practicing self-care and embracing that work-life balance by taking regular lunch breaks, working regular hours, keeping work correspondence within working hours, your team will feel that they can do the same. I also encourage all leaders to have individual check-ins with their team as a lot of people, they're just not comfortable speaking up in a group. This creates a safe space for the individual to share their burdens and struggles and is a great way to create those healthy work bonds. You never know what other people are dealing with and it's not your job to take it on, but as a leader, I think it's incredibly important to check in and offer resources that are readily available to them. And when we're eventually back at the offices, we as leaders can start to plan healthier company sponsored meals. If our companies want to encourage healthy eating, then we should be offering healthier options. And lastly, encourage breaks away from the screen. Adopt walking meetings for those meetings that you don't need to be in front of a screen. I'm sure you've all heard the term Zoom fatigue, and this is a great way to get that much needed break from the screen while still being productive. Also encourage your team to leave their workspace at lunch. Avoid the desktop dining. I am so guilty of this too though. <laughs> Okay, so at this point, let's assume that you're owning your self-care routine, your organization is fully supporting it, and now you just need the willpower to sustain this lovely self-care plan that you've put together. The only thing is, is that willpower will only get you so far. So willpower is like a muscle. The first thing to understand is that your willpower is in limited supply, so you can only use it for a short amount of time before it gives out. Self-care requires work, but so worth it. We often shy away from being responsible or doing something that is hard, but it's the difficult moments in our life that can mold us into doing great things. 
Be realistic with your expectations of yourself. You would never run a marathon without training. Small steps lead to big changes. Long-term sustainable habits are a slow process. The faster you accept that, the better off you'll be. And build on existing habits with habit stacking. Okay, so some of you are probably wondering, what is habit stacking? Well, it's attaching a new habit onto an already existing healthy habit to make it stick. Habit stacking is the fastest way to build a sustainable routine. So as you can see, there's some examples. So after I turn off my alarm in the morning, I will drink eight ounces of water. After I get out of the bed in the morning, I will immediately make the bed. So the key to success with habit stacking is you start with small expectations, build the muscle memory of completing your routine, and then you add more tasks once you're consistent. So next slide is that we're going to look at some strategies that we can consider to incorporate into our routines. All right, so this one is all about bookend your days with self-care. So start to add a few small habits into your morning and evening routine. So even if you find yourself flat out all day without caring for yourself or giving yourself some self-love, you will at least be able to reap the benefits of owning your morning and evenings. So wake up one hour earlier so you have dedicated time just for yourself. After you brush your teeth, meditate or sit quietly and think of three things that you're grateful for. Have lemon water before your morning coffee. Next, move your body. This could be five minutes of core work or push-ups while you're waiting for your coffee to brew, or maybe a quick walk around the block. Whatever works, just commit to some sort of movement to get your blood flowing first thing. Again, start small, build on as your routine becomes more comfortable. Maybe you start with five minutes and you add a minute a week. At breakfast, you could swap your toast for a nourishing smoothie. We always do a family smoothie in our house to ensure that we get our greens and goodness in right out of the gate. Try saying three self-loving affirmations as you shower to help set the tone for a positive day. And just as we can own our mornings, we can also own our evenings. So just like you want to wake up earlier, plan on going to bed one hour earlier. After dinner, tidy up your space. Set things, all the things out that you need for the next day. So your clothes, you can pack the lunches, school bags, whatever you can do to save you time in the morning and make yourself feel organized and you're not taking your to-dos to bed. Enjoy a cup of tea. Uh, you know, perhaps have a hot bath with some Epsom salt to melt, any way, to melt away any aches or pains. Um, you could take a few minutes at the end of your day to journal, write one win of the day, something that went well that day, so you're signing off on a high note. It's all about layering in these little habits that bring positive benefits to your day. So we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. And remember habits are things that we do automatically. Routines are a collection of these habits that you do on a regular basis to bring order to your day. High achievers tend to have solid routines. I encourage you to leverage habit stacking as you endeavor to upgrade your routine. Okay, and now we're gonna switch gears and we're going to get into cycle thinking. I just felt a self-care talk for women just wouldn't be complete if we didn't consider how our self-care needs shift with the seasons of our monthly cycle. Have you ever thought of your period as a productivity tool? I certainly didn't until I read the book that's here on the slide, In the Flow by Elisa Vitti. She's coined the concept of cycle thinking and teaches women all over the world on how we can use our hormone cycle to our advantage to harness our energy and productivity. It's basically a roadmap for women to help us balance our hormones and care for our bodies so we feel our best all month long. It works by syncing up our daily activities, so what we're eating, how we're showing up at work, our social, um, our fitness routines, and it's syncing that up with our internal rhythms. So it's essentially giving ourselves permission to honor the things that are happening in our bodies and how that affects how we show up at work, on the home front, in relationships, and as parents. I think many women still think this of their cycle as just having a period once a month, but your cycle is way more than just a period. In fact, the period is just the first phase of the cycle, which is referred to as menstruation. Then we get into our follicular phase, ovulation, and lastly, our luteal phase. This could easily be a whole separate webinar to cover this topic, but for time's sake for today, I just really want to highlight how we can really tune into our body and use each of these four phases to our advantage. Now, as women, we're expected to be the same every day, look after our families, go to work, be productive, race around, get all the things done, but we're not the same every day. Some days we're full of energy and others we're not. Some days we want to be social and other days we'd rather be alone. 
And when I first learned that men go through an entire hormone cycle every 24 hours, whereas our cycle is on average around 28 days, it really made me start to think of how we're expected to show up with that same level of energy and grit every day, day after day. And that's just not our reality. Hormonally, each day is a new start for men, whereas women, we have an entire month of hormonal changes affecting our energy levels. So meaning that we're not naturally supposed to show up the same every day with the same amount of energy every day. Our bodies are like the cycles of the moon, constantly changing in cyclical nature. So Heather, we yeah. just have a little bit of a discussion here around uh, for, for those individuals who are going through menopause. Oh, great question. Yes. Um, so actually in this slide here that I have, I'm, they're not written in here, but I'll kind of touch on each phase. You can also sync it to the moon. So if you're postmenopausal and you're not menstruating, you can follow the cycles of the moon because there's the four phases, just like these four phases here and also like the four seasons. So it's all connected, which is, is so cool. When I, when I first learned of this, I was just fascinated by it. Did Lorraine teach you this? Because Lorraine just wrote that down as well. <laughs> oh, really? No. And I can't see the chat either. So sorry. Thanks for, for letting me know, Lauren. No, no, no. That's we're perfect. on the same wavelength. No. Yeah, you, you were speaking about it just as she wrote that. So that was perfect. Oh, that's having. hilarious. I yeah. love it. Yeah. Okay, cool. So let's go through it. So again, our cycle is made up of these four phases. So menstrual, follicular, ovulation, and luteal. And the number of days on the slide here, they represent typically how long each of these phases last. So menstruation, typically three to seven, follicular, typically, typically seven to 10, so on and so forth. So as we look at each phase, we can also look at its own season. So from left to right, let's just go through it and let's see how we can best support ourselves at work, how we eat, how we move our bodies and the level of energy that we're working with in each phase. So in menstruation, um, think of the new moon, think of the winter season. This is a reflective phase, the darkest phase, quiet, think solitude. Um, this is a great time to evaluate projects, analyze and use the strength of your intuition to see how you're doing with projects and if necessary, make any course corrections. In this phase, you'll also wanna up your protein, iron and healthy fat intake. You'll wanna focus on lower intensity type movement like walking or yoga or Pilates. In the follicular phase, um, think of the waxing moon phase, spring, renewal, and increase of energy. So this is a great time to get creative, start planning new projects at work, brainstorm with colleagues. Eating a little bit lighter in this phase will also make you feel more energized because your hormone levels begin to rise here. And because you have a bit more energy, you may want to hit that cardio class or you may feel more inclined to network and collaborate with others. Next is the ovulatory phase. So Think full moon, summer, high energy, radiance. Connecting with others is the heart of the ovulation phase. So communicate, collaborate, and now is the time to have those big important discussions with your boss, coworkers, clients. Um, eating a little bit more on the raw side, so raw fruit and veg and the lighter grains, this will serve you well here. You may want to increase your workouts because you're gonna have even a greater rise in energy. So do those hit classes and you'll probably feel an increase in self-confidence and self-esteem most likely you'll find it easier to connect with others in this phase. And then now at the luteal phase, which is the longest phase. So here, think waning moon, think autumn. Um, once you're in your luteal phase, your energy really begins to turn inward. So think of completion, nurturing, tending. This is the ideal time to wrap up loose ends, projects or any tasks that have been lingering. You may want to avoid networking events or adding any extras to your calendar to conserve energy. Um, here, you really want to fuel your body with like cooked leafy greens, high fiber foods, uh, work on strength building exercises over cardio. Yeah, so hopefully this gives you just a bit of a framework to just be more mindful of where you're at each day and each week in your cycle and how we have the power to really schedule our life in a way that honors our body's needs. So let's work with our bodies instead of pushing against them. So I hope you all see the importance of having a better connection to your body and how you can really leverage self-care to unlock the full potential in all that you do. So when you're at work, how you're fueling your body with the foods you're choosing, how you're moving your body, um, and just being really respectful of the energy that you have within each phase and to trying to not overdo it. And as we begin to wrap up for the evening, I just wanna go for now from awareness to action. So by now, I hope you can clearly see there's a direct connection between personal wellness and professional success. 
leadership is a lifelong marathon of learning. And when we learn how to first take care of ourselves and how to activate the power of self-care, we're able to bring forth a new style of leadership where we're better equipped to lead our teams, guide our companies, support our communities and families, and live with more intention, grace, and ease. The never-ending to-do list, they're not going to end. But how you prioritize your list will be key in effective leadership. It all starts with you, your awareness to your needs and how to take action. So we'll finish where we started. Let's change the narrative of self-care. It's essential to uplevel your life personally and professionally. Self-care is work, but it's so worth it. Schedule it in, literally. Don't let it just be an idea. Book it in your calendar just as you book in all your other priorities. You need to put your self-care plan into action. Treat self-care as your life depends on it, because it does. Habit stack. Again, small habits can big, bring, big, bring big changes over time. Think health span, not lifespan. It's not the number of years, it's the quality within those years. Again, bookend your days with a ritual, however that looks to you. And lastly, lead by example. Encourage those around you to make themselves the top priority and we will all rise together. And remember, it's not about perfection. It's about commitment, effort, and progress. So before we part ways for the evening, I do have a call to action in form of a challenge. So I thought it would be fun to have a one week self-care challenge that we can all do together to incorporate a little more self-care into this coming week. So it starts this Sunday, it'll run for the week. So Sunday, we're going to meal plan and prep for the week. Monday, we're going to drink a minimum of three liters of water. Tuesday, we're going to schedule in a 30 minute walk or run. Wednesday, we're going to schedule in an hour to declutter our home office. Thursday, we're going to think of one win of the day and journal that in and go to bed one hour earlier. Friday, we're gonna wake up a half an hour earlier and have some time to meditate and or stretch or both. Saturday, connect with a friend or family member, phone call, walk, whatever is safe and works for you. It's so important to keep our social connections alive. And I hope that you stay connected with us too. So tag us on Instagram, our handles on the slide here at will.victoriachapter. Show us how you're incorporating self-care. And I'll also post this on our Instagram feed as well for you to refer back to. I really look forward to keeping the conversation alive and supporting you all on your self-care journey. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us this evening. I hope you're feeling more empowered to put yourself first. And I'd now like to open the lines to hear what's resonating with you. And if anyone has any other self-care strategies to add to the conversation, that would be wonderful. Yeah, so Lauren, if there's any questions, by all means, um, people can unmute or you can just speak for them. Um, no other questions. Just a comment, just saying uh, thank you very much for the great and well-organized presentation. Uh, someone had to move on to the next meeting. So have a good evening. Oh. Thank you. I love the, uh, the idea of the challenge though. We'll definitely, definitely join in on that. Hi. Well, it's like the little so things will spark bigger things. Oh. So can we unmute and speak or? Oh yeah, by all means. Okay, so I, you know, I just wanted to add that I, I'm not sure if you said it, but spending time in nature is also like another good way to self care. Is my best way to self care. Um, yes, fresh absolutely. Air. I'll just turn on my camera so you guys can see my face. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so. Um, yeah, so nature. I think fresh air and just feeling small like when you especially if you're in bc because this is a victoria so especially if you're in bc there's a lot of like um nature around and i feel like it's one of the best ways to self care so going for a hike or just going to a park just being around nature so you can feel small it kind of and feel like you're connected it kind of makes you want to take more about take care of yourself more Absolutely. I know we say in our family, get some vitamin N, vitamin nature. Exactly. <laughs> yes. No, I so appreciate you bringing that up. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. If there's no other questions or comments, there's lots of thank yous coming down the page. Um, 
hopefully you get a chance to look at them, Heather, before you close out the evening. But on behalf of Will and the attendees and the Victoria chapter, I want to thank you very much for an incredible presentation. I've learned so much and I'm hoping that I can that I can join the challenge. And the first one, I love the meal planning, although I feel like I should call you up and you should tell me exactly how to do that because <laughs> that, that's one that I'm always challenged with. Um, but thank you so much. It was an incredibly uh, chock full of information that we can all use every day. And I really appreciate your time in putting this all together for us. Uh, thank you very much, Heather. And I'll just turn it over to Julie as we end our evening. Well, thank you so much thank all for you. attending tonight's event and a huge thanks to Heather for a thought provoking talk, leaving us all with many tips to support our self care practice. As Heather mentioned, please do follow us on social media, subscribe to our newsletter to stay informed on future events and have a good evening and we hope to see you all again soon. Bye. Thanks everyone.